other side of the world, Katie Tunstall, welcome. What Thank an opener. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sad, emotional, big uh, fat beat underneath it. Now, we know each other. You know that's my favourite song of yours. I love that tune. I didn't know, I know that. I absolutely love that tune. Oh, that's really cool. Um, Thank you. I mean, lyrically, it's, it was, was Eye to the Telescope, is it pretty much a heartbreak? Half of it seems as though yeah. you're kind of whispering tearfully in someone's ear and the other half you're kind of kicking the door down. <laughs> I... Um, that's basically a really good description of my musicality and my outfit. Um, I always, when, I, when this record came out, I always referred it to kitchen table songs. And I think even now when I listen to that record, it's, I love that you can hear everything. You can just imagine, immediately visualise what's getting played by mm. a person. There's no kind of samples or trickery or layers on it. You know, yeah. it's very real. And... Um, it's 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 an autobiographical record and it was it was really just songs inspired by relationships and emotional stories and it other side of the world in particular was about my one of my best friends Anna and her thankfully now husband Don um they made it they made it yes. after the song was written though oh, so basically I, my first big love in my life was this hippie dude called Ethan who lived in Vermont and sort of opened me up to a whole bohemian way of life that I'd never really experienced in Scotland. Well, I had actually a little bit with the musicians, but it was, they built their own houses and went, had a generator they turned on for an hour a day, went and washed in the lake. And I would have married this guy like that. I was yeah. just completely in love at 17. And, um, and I was on a visa because I'd gone to school there and I had to go home. Oh no. And I was just completely distraught and heartbroken for a couple of years. It took me a long time to get over it. And um, and my my BFF Anna and her dude Don had come to stay with me in my flat in London. And I was probably, it was not long, but it was within a couple of years of this coming out. Yeah. And uh, or very early 2000s. And they split up in my flat. Oh, no. And they'd been together for a few years and they were so perfect for each other. And I'm just sitting there going... <laughs> and it's bringing up all the memories of yeah. just the distance being the well, it's thing. such a fundamental kind of part of being in love, isn't it? Is, yeah. is how do you cope when you're not together? I know, and it's if your bond can kind of survive that distance yeah. and, and it's as sliding doors of if you were in the same place it would be perfect yeah. or would it um anyway they split up i wrote the song they got back together now i can dedicate it to both of them Amazing. so that's nice oh that's fantastic yeah. uh, i just want to ask you about the video as well did you intentionally uh, i've got a great story for you about that video <laughs> did you intentionally replicate the uh, especially for you video with kylie and jason <laughs> 100 <laughs> percent because it's the same thing isn't it the yeah same. kylie's kind of like they keep not missing each my other fault by... <laughs> blame the directors they came up with the treatment but an amazing story about that video so it's this split screen thing i never met the dude he's oh, wow. my boyfriend yeah, yeah. so he's in new york and i'm in london and i'm in a london cab and then the other half is yeah. the new york cab and we've got other girlfriends and boyfriends and um fast forward about four years I'm in a bar on the Lower East Side in New York, a couple of sheets to the wind, standing, it's like a, it was a Bob Dylan tribute night at some bar in Lower yeah. East Side, and I'm standing at the bar and this good looking man comes up next to me and he's a bit out there as well and he's ordering a drink and I'm just looking at him going, I know you. What, how do I know this guy? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm in New York. And he looks at me and I'm like, Oh my God, you're my pretend boyfriend. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and he looks at me, totally freaks out. Like, and he's what? like, what? And I'm like, uh, uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most awkward thing ever. Brilliant. It was uh, really funny. It's, 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 it's my favourite song. I love Thank it so you. much. Uh, take me back to, though, before, you know, let's, let's, let's rewind a bit. So you're kind of a, a budding musician in mm. Fife, uh, kind of, kicking against the railing against it all kind of yeah I mean it was a very it was a very uh, singular kind of soul training becoming a, a, a wannabe musician for me because I'd started off in a family that wasn't musical that didn't even really listen to music Wow so it all been about playing instruments for me I, I like was 
uh, begging for a piano when I was four years old. And I look at my nieces and nephews now and I'm like, that's so young yeah. to be that focused on doing something. Anyway, I sort of became this prodigious little, you know, Fife's answer to Mozart. Wow. I was like, I think it's 150 is distinction. And I got 149 wow. in my grade one. And my piano teacher, oh my I goodness. just came to a gig and I didn't remember this, but she was saying, you brought your coloring book instead of your music to your exam. <laughs> I was and saying still, like And this. still nailed it. <laughs> and I just did it by memory. Oh my goodness. Um, and it was just this really consistent, very quick kind of downward trajectory of application and <laughs> achievement that on was, piano. Was kind of, you were kind of like, yeah, I can do this. I can relax. I it. just got worse and worse and worse. And I just didn't care about the, the exams you can, you and stuff. You can get bogged down in the, in the mechanics of music. Quite yeah, well, it you? wasn't for me. And piano never ended up being the instrument for me. I couldn't master it. I couldn't really improvise on it. Um, and that trajectory led all the way to picking up a guitar when yeah. I was 15 and just taught myself. So I'd, I'd also actually been classical trained, classically trained as a flautist. So I'd got this classical training, which I don't think you need to be a contemporary musician, but it is useful because you get this the discipline theory yeah. and you understand chord progression and you understand intervals and harmony and all of these things which has been really useful um but i think it was really cool that i didn't get any lessons for guitar and voice i just taught myself no one was telling me the right way and the wrong way mm -hmm. to do things and uh, and it, i did my first gig in a pub called the vic in st andrews when i was just just turning 17 or end of 16 and king creaso came because wow. he was a local musician yeah, yeah. he fancied one of my mates she was coming to the show he came to the show and afterwards asked me to join his band fantastic and then Do suddenly you remember what your first song was that you played the first song at that gig i had god what was i playing i've got a little cassette that i made of those songs and I was it mainly song. covers or was it all your no, own stuff? No, it's all my own stuff. I've got a terrible memory. So I was wow. really rubbish at playing other people's songs. It has a song called Parachute Man, which I've never released. Wow. Um, Hold my hand, let me fall, we'll along the way down. It's nice. nice Amazing. Song. It's better than um, Rick Astley's first song. <laughs> what right. was that? That was called Ruddy Big Pig. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I think Rick Astley should re release the old uh, release them, the old demos. So. And what year would that have been then? That was that was kind of that was ninety three. So ninety three. So yeah. so take me through what happened between ninety three and say getting signed. Was it was it? So let's think. So I'm seventy five. So I was eighty five. So I was like seventeen. I ended up going to America, where I met my heartbreaker the hippie love. Ethan. Yeah. At seventeen, and then when I came back, I went to uni down in London, but I knew. I'd met the Fence Collective guys. Was that just you kind of playing lip service to your parents? or Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And just getting a ticket to London. Yeah. Um, I'd met the Fence Collective guys. I'd met the Beta Band guys. They were all kind of up in Fife. Um, I'd done my first bits of gigging. And they, they were all busking all around Europe and mm. making money and hand to mouth and living in cottages on the outside. Uh, totally off grid. Yeah. You know, Robert Smith jumpers. Catch up on your pasta. <laughs> Excellent. Recording at three in the morning, and it was just like, right, I'm in. Yeah. I want that. Yeah, and I don't yeah. care about having a job, or I don't care about making money. I don't care about new clothes or going out, or you know, I just want. You just I want the, to live my days you doing have the hunger. Yeah, something yeah. I love doing. Yeah. So there wasn't really an ambition for greatness on the kind of globe on a global stage. There wasn't. I, I'd love the idea of traveling and playing, but it was from a very kind of troubadour, guitar on your back yeah. kind of way. Kind of Dick Whittington kind of um, And after I, and college was good, uni, I went to your Royal Holloway, I did music and theater. The music stuff was all really classical, so I fobbed that off. And then just did theater, it was an amazing theater course. It was a good music course as well, but just not for me. And the performance side of that was really cool. Mm. I'd done a lot of theater growing up in St. Andrews, and so the performance side of it was really interesting. Um, and I thought I'd meet an amazing band and get, you know, maybe get a deal and stay in the totally didn't happen at all. So I just went straight back to St. Andrews wow. um, and shacked up with King Creosote's brother, Ian, who's an amazing musician. My favorite memories is him just playing note for note Django Reinhardt at two in the morning. Just fantastic. Yeah. And then, 
you know, it's good. It's good memories. It was hard because I was trying to get somewhere. But because I'd met those guys, I was quite adamant to do it independently. I didn't want a big major record deal that's selling out. Yeah. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. And then I got to 27. <laughs> and I'm yeah, like, quite, um, I, I quite like that major record. I think I need a deal. <laughs> uh, so I had started kind of getting myself down to London every now and then. I'd met this guy, Paul, who ran a pub in Marlebone called The Rising Sun, which is now called The Marlebone Sun, maybe, right, just okay. on the corner, opposite the Conran shop. And he would spend the entire pub's month budget on getting me and my band down so I could do the open mic night in the Cashmere Club around the corner. Right, okay. And that was ultimately where I got signed. Wow. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a lot of, it was a lot of shifting. It was a lot of reaching dead ends. That's not working, do mm. this. Reach the dead end do this so uh we're, we're gonna we're gonna take a break and you're gonna play as a song in a minute uh and it's, it's black horse and the cherry tree yeah. which i think is kind of i guess is the epitome of the album really in terms yeah. of in terms of in terms of its sound and its kind of attitude mm -hmm. and also i guess this, this is the, certainly the first time i'd seen anyone with a loop pedal and it's ironic because it wasn't on the record was it not no i wrote it after the record was finished it was because I'd, I'd recorded this album and it was really just me and a drummer mm. and Steve Osborne, the producer, played a bit of bass, but it was all really on a couple of people and we get a couple of friends in to do bits and pieces. It wasn't a band, but it was, it was, a, it, I, I, but I found my sound with Steve Yeah. and it was, it was all about rhythm and I was like, I am just Phoebe from Friends playing Smelly Cat. <laughs> And that is, I am so tired. I'd done 10 years of it. <laughs> <sighs> and I was just like, it doesn't feel like who I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, what was um, the eureka moment? Was it, was it this song? The eureka moment was I was being courted by a record label called Relentless. And they said, I'll tell you what, to get to know us, why don't you come and be the lead singer and help, help do a bit of writing with our Jewish hip hop band, what? Oiva Boy. <laughs> So what, what, I joined, a, I joined a Jewish hip hop band <laughs> <laughs> for a year. What were they called? Oi <laughs> <laughs> And They're amazing. They're still going. Oh amazing musicians. Great people. So I joined them and their sound guy, Moshik, I was sort of telling him, ah, I've just got, I've got to go out and promote the record and I've just, I'm so bored. And he was like, I've got this pedal in my bag. Why don't you try it? And he brings out the same pedal that I'm using now. Wow. It's an Akai Headrush. I'm on Akai Headrush 2 now. Um, and the Eureka moment really was, surely if I bash my guitar, it's going to sound like a drum. Yeah. I'd never seen anyone. I'd seen people loop guitar stuff. I'd seen people loop vocal stuff, but I'd never seen anyone do it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I'd never seen anyone really properly use the guitar as a kit, you know? Mm. Um, and I bashed it and it sounded awful. So we had to kind of tweak and work out some EQ stuff and use a desk to get everything into, because it only had one input. And yeah, yeah. we got there in the end and I actually had a, I've got a drawing somewhere in my journal. A schematic of, of it. how to plug it in, because I had to do it myself yeah. at first when I went and played all these coffee shops and pubs and stuff. Um, and. And that was the moment. And the crazy thing was that uh, when it when it came to Jules Holland, um, the Allison, the scout, had come round checking me out as a as a new artist on the show. And uh, I was working out Black Horse was really written to see how that thing worked. And could I write a song with a vocal thing that went all the way mm. through? Yes. <laughs> and uh, but it was it was fresh, you know. And I'd been playing it in little. At little coffee shop gigs and stuff, but the album was done. Yeah. And so when I got the call to do Jules Holland, I'm like, well, shall I play Other Side of the World? Because that was pegged that was the as the yeah, first yeah. single. And um, and Shabs, my label boss, was like, nah, 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 play that woohoo thing. <laughs> the woohoo thing. And I was like, but it's not on the record. He was like, trust me, horsey song. Horsey play. Off, go on, off horse song. Horsey song. Off you go. <laughs> and I played it. And, and that was it. The rest is history. Yeah. yeah. But we did not have a recording of it. So the first 10,000 copies of that have got the audio from Jules Holland. Oh my God. As a bonus track. 
So it's a little a little eBay special. Amazing. If you've got that, oh, fantastic. sell it and just get a <laughs> sell it, get another one. I remember seeing you play it live for the first time, and and you I think I think you, you you kind of fronted it with a conversation you'd had with your mother about it, where she couldn't understand what the black horse was. Yeah, and we were just was like, like, it's a metaphor, mother. Yeah. She was like, are you sure you want to think about marrying a horse? <laughs> like, it's, it's evil, mother. It's evil. Well, uh, Katie, off you pop, horsey song, please. Later, <laughs> <Thank you>. later. <laughs>
of being 29 and looking 18 <laughs> was that I'd... Oh, look at you. Look I know, at little baby. little face. Um, I think it was the fact that I had lived a, a while. Yeah. I had worked incredibly hard to get to that point for a decade mm. of having no money, of having no you know, having endless opportunities to try and get stuff happening. And How many it, times and did you working. think, I can't do this, it's not happening? I never thought that. Didn't you? No, I never ever had a moment of going, I had desperate moments. Mm. I think one of my worst moments was actually um, in Edinburgh when I finally got, I can't remember who it was, but it was some London A&R guy said he was going to come up to Scotland to see a show. Which is a big deal to get up to come It's a really there. big deal and I just didn't have any money and I just had to borrow cash and I managed to find a venue that said if you, you know, and it was a horrible pay to play situation mm. and I'm on the board for small music venues because of, because because of this of that, yeah. stuff. Is, you know, they basically make you pay to play and you've yeah. got, if you don't sell the tickets, you owe them money. Oh yeah. I'd just done everything and he just didn't show up. Oh, no. And it was just like, oh. And that was, I think, when I realised that I couldn't, I wasn't going to manage Have to do it Have you seen him Scotland. since? Is he no, still around? No, I don't even remember who he was, yeah, which is probably... <laughs> lucky for him. Yeah, it's the best. The best revenge is not remembering who it was. Yeah. But um, I knew at that point that I was going to have to, I was going to have to leave. Yeah. Which was fine. I was okay about it. It was just, the thing that worried me was I just didn't want to move to London with no money. Mm. Uh, yeah, Edinburgh is a much easier to place to live on a budget. And uh, a very good friend and mentor, Bobby Heatley, who had colour sound studios and rehearsal rooms up in Edinburgh, his dad had written the GMTV theme tune. Wow. <laughs> do, 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 do. So, uh, and had, had, had ended up not really um, being looked after in terms of like how the deal went, he yeah. wasn't he wasn't up on how to do the deal, so for songwriting and mm. had been screwed a few times, and so Bobby kind of really put his energy into helping his dad and and anyone else he saw with talent to try and secure them as writers. And mm. He'd always said to me, "Get signed as a writer before you sign your record deal, uh, get your publishing deal because it's two separate things." Yeah, yeah. Um, and I totally took his advice and got signed. With my publishing deal, first. and that gives you a bit of that and that gave you the luxury me money to yeah. to move to London. It gave me money and space to move to London, sit in my basement flat in Gospel Oak, look at the cover of Horses by Patti Smith, this amazing picture by Robert Maplethorpe, and go, I want to be her. Ding ding ding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> write these, you know, and have the space and time to write songs that ended up propelling this thing yeah, into yeah. a beast. Talk to me about the recording of it. So you mentioned your producer. Yeah. So how, how did you two meet and what so was the process that you did? We had didn't... very little budget. I think we made the record for about, I think we made the record for about 20 grand. Wow. Which is not a lot no. for making a record because you've got to pay the producer as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Martin Morales, who was my first day in our guy at Relentless, he had mentioned Steve Osborne. I didn't know who Steve was. I didn't know who any producers was. I didn't. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in studio recording. Oh, okay. Um, I wasn't someone who'd look at the back of records and knew who. I just like listening to stuff. Yeah. Um, and I didn't particularly like being in a studio either. Um, and Martin mentioned Steve Osborne and said, you know, he's placebo. You two doves. I was like, well, that sounds really interesting. Getting like basically a. He sounds not crap. A yeah. guy <laughs> rock. <laughs> Uh, you know, rock guy, yeah. dude, to come and bring, and at least then I knew it wouldn't become saccharine. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's definitely what yeah. I didn't want was to sort of become a pop record. Um, ironed out, and so we didn't have a lot of budget, so we had to kind of be creative about where we recorded. Mm. And Steve knew this guy called Nick, who had been a roadie, but he'd been in an accident, so he'd ended up in a wheelchair. And he lived in this house in Bradford on Avon, Bradford upon Avon, just wow. outside Bath, where Steve lives. And he'd converted his house where he lives with his mum in the middle of nowhere into this crazy DIY studio. Do you ever feel like you were in like a League of Gentlemen? It was like it was full on <laughs> League of Gentlemen. So his mum is this like crazy old little Italian lady who was sort of doddering. She'd go, tea? 
bacon sandwich? <laughs> and then we were like, all right, thanks. <laughs> uh, the house I'm just about continually like the smell of bacon sandwiches. We'd be like taping duvets on the wall. The vocal booth was the disability ramp between Nick's bedroom and the studio. So you could either kind of, it was a bit Elvis. You could kind of go up the way or go yeah, down yeah. the way. But the, the major thing about the studio was he had an amazing old desk, right, okay. which sounded superb. And the whole, the whole place sounded amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's called Nam, is the name of the studio. Um, and we were staying in these like weird old B&Bs and sometimes when the budget ran out, I mean, Steve was driving us everywhere. We were staying in his kids' bunk beds. We were like stealing the Pop-Tarts in the morning. It was, it the was real crazy. Kind of, real kind of Dunkirk spirit though, kind of, kind of. It was properly all in, yeah. yeah. And when I look back, I mean, Steve didn't know what was gonna happen with the records. Mm. So it was an absolute labour of love on yeah. his part and his family. So how would you so, how would you put together a song in the studio? I mean, obviously, had you, had you, they were all pretty much written just you and guitar. It was pr written me and guitar. There was a really really fantastic moment. So we went. St what I'd found the years leading up to actually getting a deal was, I always sounded more exciting on my own than I did with a band. Yeah. And I couldn't work out why. I was like, surely more players should make this more exciting. Um, and Steve was, we did what's called pre-production where you sit and listen yeah. to stuff and work out what you're gonna do. And he went, I know what the problem is. And there was a song on this called Miniature Disasters. Mm -hmm. And the beat is, that's, and it's very syncopated rhythm. Actually, Eye of the Tiger, but on a different beat. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Um, and when I'd play with a band before, and I and I see it now when I see cover bands doing suddenly I see. Yeah. Ding ding go dong ding 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 go dong. The drummer is going that's not what's going on. It's going it's yeah. the Bo Diddley beat. Yeah. And with something like Miniature Disasters, the drummer would go bonk jang 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 dunk jang totally straight, really boring, mm -hmm. completely ironing out the percussion that's coming from me. And a rhythm section is usually bass and drums. Yeah. And I've come to realize that the rhythm section with my music is my rhythm guitar and the drummer. Yeah. So the bassist can actually be quite melodic and do mm. other things. I'm holding it down with the drummer. And so Steve was just like, right. He pointed at the drummer and he goes, you just do what her right hand is doing. Only, don't think, just watch her right hand. Mm. So the drummer starts going totally different world. Yeah. And totally just signature yeah. sound. Yeah. Like no one else was sounding like that. And that was the, that was it. That yeah. was the moment where that became a recognizable Katie Tunstall song. Amazing. And it was and I, and I have Steve to thank for that, for discovering that, because otherwise I would only ever be able to play solo. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the art of a, of a really good producer, though, isn't it? It really it's, is, it's, is it's, finding it's that original. Sifting original. through yeah. everything yeah. else and picking Being up. Being able to find the essential oil yeah. of, of that thing, you know? And, um, and I mean, I still, I still very much adhere to that style of, uh, of drumming mm -hmm. and with my rhythm. And I, I mean, this new record's just covered in syncopated rhythm yeah, still. Yeah. And well, it's you, isn't it? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, we're gonna have another song now. Talk to me about Heal Over, it's a bit of a fan favorite, right? Yeah, so Heal Over is an interesting one. And um, people often ask me, do you get sick of playing stuff? And I did, I got sick of playing Heal Over. Praise be to the gods that I did not get famous for playing a sad song. <laughs> because <laughs> can you imagine, nothing compares to you. Every, oh, I mean, all, me. have, just crying yeah. all the time. <laughs> Amazing song, I'm one of the best ever, neck, but just yeah. like, whew, yeah, you'd get I'm hot. To, I'm, I'm to, well, just having to, having to kind of find that, find that place every time. It's, I'm very grateful that I've been, that I've, I've found my success with two really joyful Yeah, hits. I mean, poor Adele. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh. it's a lot of vocal work singing like that as yeah. well. Um, poor Adele. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, she yeah. should throw herself off a wallet. She's all right. Um, but Heal Over was one of those songs where I was just a bit like, oh, here, you know, and I love the song. Yeah. 
but I, I, I just find it a bit laborious to play it. Mm. Um, and, but people kept asking for it. Mm. And I was like, okay. And my, my loop setup started out just me, guitar, and loop. It's now me, guitar, loop, Juno keyboard, hand sonic sampler, TR8 drum machine. I mean... You've become the Stephen Hawking of acoustic yeah, I mean, music. <laughs> <laughs> Can I please put that on my billboard? <laughs> Katie Tunstall, the Stephen Hawking of music. Jamie East, love uh, it. Um, it was a brief career. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, and basically what's happened is that I need to keep challenging myself to keep interested. So I just keep adding other bits and pieces and it's really fun and fun for fans because they see a new thing yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. every time. Yeah. And I was like, right, with all this gear, if I can't find a way to play this song in a way that's, that I like, because it's a good song, and I always say if it's a good song, you can play it a myriad of ways. Yeah. And I said, if I can't find a way, then that's on me because I sh it's, it's my failing. So I've tinkered about, and I love electronic music. I always have, mm -hmm. right from Orbital, there's a, lot more there's a lot more electronics on, on this album than you, than you yeah. first, first realised until you kind of, ah, okay, yeah, it's a little definitely. bit of a moody I, thing I've going on. I've always loved synths and keyboards and I got into Ninja Tune and Chemical Brothers and Orbital and all of that stuff. Yeah. And um, the grid, I used to love the grid. Oh my God, the grid. I remember, oh, so good. Was it, the cow was it Cowboy that they did? Yes. Yeah. Um, and that, anyway. Banjo, banjo, te it, banjo, yeah, techno. Was it, yeah. <laughs> I was like, folk music and techno. <laughs> um, and uh, I've got, I've totally just now back in like Froome at a grid gig. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I found a way to play it, which I absolutely love. And I only play it live. I've not recorded this before. Oh, okay. So uh, it would be lovely to, to get, to it, get down. it to get it down. Well, let's let's do that then. Let's get it down. This is Heal Over the 2018 version. Emotional. Take it away. <laughs>
There's a really good podcast at the moment where uh, someone interviews Ryan Tedder. He's, oh, yeah, he's an yeah. amazing kind of songwriter. Yeah. And he he sums up a hit in, in as, as one of two things. He says there's a hit that you have to work your arse off for. Mm -hmm. There's a hit that you have to kind of plug away, that you have to do. You have to do your Richard and Judy. You have to do the kind of top of the pops. You have to do everything mm -hmm. in every single country. And he said, and then he said, they're great and they're really satisfying. He said, but there, nothing compares to the other hit, mm. which is where, yes, you do all the great work, you do all the hard work, and then the hit just, just, hit, it keeps on hitting whilst you're asleep. Honestly, this one was. And suddenly I see. Bonkers, still bonkers. Yeah. Still bonk bonks. It's like, it's like, like it's like, it's like a businessman. It's like they say, they say, find a business that, that keeps earning you money whilst you're asleep. Like yeah. Oil or gas I or think, water. Yeah, I think of it as like my little sort of, like, like sort of workhorse. That it's like a Tamagotchi. Yeah, it's always it is. Awake. It's, yeah. it's, it's an incredible thing. Yeah. And I, something I will be grateful for till the day I die. Because. But the, it, it didn't stick out complete, very much when we make the record. No right. one was going, whoa. Steve said he knew it was a goal and it Steve, was really uh, catchy, but yeah. no one was like, this has the potential to be an enormous global hit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, with this record in general, it was the advent of TV shows and films starting to realise that teaming up with breaking artists was a kind of very mutually beneficial mm. um exploit which is fantastic for musicians because yeah. it's a saturated market there's it's very difficult even with the internet it's difficult to get seen yeah, yeah. you know and so it's i think it's really really cool that that tv shows and films actively kind of provide a platform for for brand new artists that no one's ever heard of um and i got the call from my manager going your song is going to open a meryl street movie I went, what? And he said, look, I'm going to say this and don't take it the wrong way, but you need to enjoy this because it'll probably never happen again. I said, what do you mean? I won't get, I won't get my song in a film ever again. He said, no, 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 not that. 
They're using your song completely unedited with no dialogue over the top from the start to the finish to open the movie. I was like, eh? What? What? And I mean, I don't think I've ever seen another film. No, I can't. No, now that, that, does that. now that you've said that, I from can't... start to finish, like what a privilege. credits, Meryl Streep, you know, Anne Hathaway, absolute modern classic. Yeah, you know, people hear that song in the street, they start pretending they're on a catwalk, and it was just this crazy skeleton key that went, and the door opened, and it was yeah. like. Whoa. It was your ticket to the, to the whole I world, was wasn't it? I was suddenly doing a nine-page fashion photo shoot in Japan. I was, you know, suddenly, pardon the pun, being played in households all over America. Yeah. And, you know, it's 2005, I think that was. So, really, YouTube was new. Yeah. It wasn't... It's not the behemoth it is now. No, it yeah. was, it was, it was, things going viral was quite a new idea. And, um, yeah, it just, um, and it, it and, it, and it, it wasn't this flash in the pan thing. It was this monster that just. But it came just at the grew. right, it came at the right time because like I said, you were fully formed. So yeah. had that happened when you were kind of 19 yeah that would have been chaos yeah well it was that it would have been and it was that double kind of pincer of of jewels mm. so if someone liked suddenly i see oh who's this chick whoa that's cool yeah you know um i and i should have said with jewels the other thing is there's one thing getting these opportunities they're not they're no use if you make a hash of it. No, exactly. You've got to, you've be got to, you've got to nail the goods. Mm. And in terms of the of suddenly I see, it's nailing something in the studio that sounds different. And not only sounds different, but I hear it now. I'm like, yep, still sounds good. Yeah, it really does. So it's um, and it, it, it's choice. A lot of it is choices. I think of creative choices of how you want to make something. And um, yeah. And you, and you, you hear that, I mean, that you, we talked a bit about the rhythm and, and finding your sound in the studio, but, you know, you still hear suddenly I see it kind of bled through into, into mm. other artists, whether it's Sharon Van Etten mm. or whether it's kind of Ed Sheeran, you know, that whole kind of thing, kind of you created this, 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 this mini movement with it. I'd, I'd love to think I'm at least part of it. Yeah. I mean, when I signed my deal, Nora Jones had just broken. And part of the reason that I couldn't get any interest was because it was just all indie boy bands. Mm. That's all anyone cared about was, you know, Kings of Leon and Killers and all that stuff. And uh, Nora Jones had just broken, been hugely successful. And I vividly remember going around record companies in London and they'd go, yeah, we've got our girl who plays a thing. Yeah, thanks very much. I was much. like, really? <laughs> How many guys have you got that play a thing? Yeah. Because I think they all play a thing. Um, and I remember just being like, oh my God, but also I don't want to sign with you, yeah. you know? And so I ended up signing with Relentless yeah. and, um, and certainly the Looper thing, no one had really seen. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I think there was just a thirst for seeing a girl with tech who could play something. Yeah. Stomping with around some in attitude. docks. Yeah in a pair of boots yeah and is it a feminist record this one is it, is it I don't particularly think so no I mean I've never really come at my music from a gender no specific place because people, always... people thought you were making a statement with the braces didn't they so I totally no one thought about it yeah and it was my stylist at the time had them in her bag I was talking about horses and saying how the cover of Horses by Patti Smith was such uh, an inspiration and it was why I'd written Suddenly I See and it's just the most cool photograph. And we're like, yeah, but I'm like the children's presenter version of Patti Smith. <laughs> and she was like, well, this is what they'd wear on Blue Peter. Amazing. And I put them, I was like, yeah, they're cool. They're very cool. We didn't think twice about so you, it. So you, you all of a sudden became a, became a lesbian icon. I was a lesbian icon. <laughs> no, not mad at that. No, no, All absolutely. good. But I remember... One of the most overwhelming things when it first all kicked off was, I think it was in Sheffield doing a show, and there was a massive roundabout, and we're in the van going round, and there's big trees on the roundabout. And as I'm going round, it was tree, 
vertical rainbow, like the size of a tree, 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 vertical rainbow. And as we came around, it was just the most enormous billboard wow. of this that I'd ever seen. And I was like, that was felt great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the writers, so, so like you say, is, Patty, is, is it about Patti Smith or, or, or influenced by it, Patti no, Smith? No, it is about Patti yeah. Smith. It's about looking at her in that image and about seeing mystery, seeing someone who is not needing to try at all. They are just being. And they, it's almost, the insouciance is almost challenging mm. where she's like, I know who I am. Who are you? And, I, and ironically, I have not felt that confidence until quite recently. You know, this is, this is a wee thing finding our way, knowing that I was a really good musician, but really not knowing how to, how, how, to uh, how to use becoming well known mm. or how to enjoy being famous or how to strategize about where I, want to, I mean, I, I remember my booking agent saying, album two, right, Katie, you've done really well, let's do arenas. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, that's not what I do. Yeah. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> and now I'd love to do it, you know? And I was just afraid. I was just afraid. But, you, but you do, you're afraid of either, what, not being cool or... or, or not, I just or... felt, I was, I mean, I'm, I'm an artist from 2004 and I think people probably may not remember that it was a massive no-no to do brand partnerships, yeah, to do yeah. adverts. I mean... It was the anti-corporate, it was the Naomi did, Klein yeah, era, wasn't it? You yeah. did not do that stuff because you got super judged, you know? Yeah. And I was from a very indie background and it wasn't cool to sign a record deal. Yeah. So I, I lost a lot of opportunity, but, but I'm, I don't regret it at all. No. Because it was really important to me to get known as a musician. Yeah. and nothing else Absolutely. so you know and i always just was just like i am not going to be the girl whose music was like to sani pad I'm not doing that <laughs> oh that's the sani pad girl no <laughs> nope uh well from sani pads to an actual phenomenon <laughs> <laughs> sani pad <laughs> uh you're gonna play suddenly i see for us and can yeah. i can i just thank you for this song because this gave me one of my favorite moments of my life which was no. uh, so as you know uh we have a mutual friend in in, in kenny Yo, Kenny. Uh, Kenny played keyboards for you for many for years. For many years, yeah. And I Kenny Dickinson. remember his excitement at uh, playing Top of the Pops with you for Suddenly I See. So excited. So all his friends, all his family tuned in to watch. Mm -hmm. Kenny plays keyboard. And there's not a lot of keyboard on Suddenly I See. So Katie, <laughs> goes, wonderfully, ding. thank you very much for this, Katie, because she made my one of my best friends go on Top of the Pops and play the bin lids. So from the <laughs> bottom of my heart, thank you for that moment. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs>
So just to summarise, uh, what's your favourite track on the album? That's a really, really, really hard question. Um, I've never, ever been asked that. Do you it know change? What? Um, it does change, but I think I would probably answer with what I love playing live the most, yeah, yeah. which is Suddenly I See. Yeah because there's just nothing like hitting the first two bars of a song. And there's just this, you're just the purveyor of joy. Yeah. It's, and it's such a beautiful, simple, instant transference yeah, yeah. of something through your ears that goes straight in your heart. And you just see from whether I'm playing to two people or 20,000, it's just like woof, and um, that's a gift. That's just you know whatever. I don't know how I write songs. Yeah, I wrote suddenly. I see in half an hour. Wow, and I'm just so grateful that I get to have one of those where oh, anywhere in the world, everyone knows it. You know, so it's um, and it's a really fun song to play. So. Is there any? Is there any? Any? Is there a song on there that you'd either take off or, or want to rework? If, no. no. I, I spent many years feeling very, very mixed emotions about the mix of this record. Uh, it was really tough because Steve and I made an indie garage record and it sounded like, I mean, it was indie rock. It was really raw. And I was incredibly naive. I didn't know anything about the process and I was very angry for a long time because the masters just got whisked away like I'd had a baby and it just got taken mm. and I was not involved in the mix process. I didn't know anything about it and it suddenly just came back and it had been mixed. As a fake complete, yeah. As it had been mixed by someone and I, it sounded to me like someone had just taken an iron and just gone like that right. over the whole thing and particularly the other side of the world. It just sounded so polished and mm. and... It does stand just, out as, a, as the poppiest song. I'm I know, yeah. and I was I was not into it. It didn't sound like that mm. when I w w the last time I'd seen it, heard it, you know. Um, and I remember finding it quite difficult because it, the album then did so well, and people really fell in love with it that it, it was totally counterproductive for me. And I knew that to then sit there and go, I don't like it. It was like, that's not going to help me. That's not going to help fans. That's not going to help yeah. the label sell my record. So uh, there was a lot of biting my tongue for a long time. And now I can talk about it with, you know, yeah. with, with years in the past. And, and I listened back to it and I realized that it sounds great. And I'm really, and it still sounds really raw compared to 
a lot of other stuff that yeah. was coming out and still does come out now. And um, so, no, I'll leave it be. I'll leave it be. Perfect. Katie, yeah. thank you so much. Brilliant stories, brilliant oh, album, brilliant It's person. lovely talking about it. Thank you for having me. Thank you me. for coming on Virgin Radio Classic Albums, Katie Tunstall. <laughs> it's all about the music. Virgin Radio.